Hello, my name is Denny Paul May. And I'm Brenda Combs. And we're the KVEC Due Process Consultants, and we're here to provide you with Indicator 13 training that is KDE approved. This indicator is an overview of how to become proficient in the use of Kentucky Compliance Record Review document to access district's compliance as required under the Indicator 13 and the appropriate methods for documenting Indicator 13 compliance. This is the Kentucky Administration, Administration Regulations concerning the IEP section for transition services. If you look at the slide, you will see that to have uh, transition services, you must have appropriate post-secondary goals, and they are based on your transition assessments, and it's related to training, uh, education, and employment, and where appropriate, independent living skills. And the transition services, uh, including your course of study, they need to assist a child in reaching these goals. So your transition services for children with disabilities may be special education, it provided uh, a specially designed instruction or related services, and if required to assist a child with disability to benefit from special education. Today's presentation will focus only on how to document the nine post-secondary transition requirements to meet compliance for Indicator 13. This is not to take away from other transition-related requirements in IDEA or the KARs. We focus on these nine requirements because they are the components of Indicator 13 of the State Performance Plan and the Annual Performance Report. The Kentucky Department of Education is required to report the monitoring findings of these nine components to the Office of Special Education Programs or OSEP in Washington each year. Since Kentucky has been reporting our monitoring data for Indicator 13, Kentucky has not yet attained the required 100% compliance rate. As a result, OSEP requires that KDE ensure that any non-compliance found in a local district be corrected within one year. The OSEP also mandates that any non-compliance found in any individual student's record is to be corrected within one year unless the student leaves the district's jurisdiction. On this slide, we're continuing our transition services uh, and we're looking at uh, agencies. So if an outside agency other than your local education uh, uh, people uh, fails to provide the transition services described in that IEP, the LEA uh, shall reconvene the ARC to identify alternative strategies uh, to meet the child's transition objectives set out in that IEP. So this slide provides an overview of the transition services section for the compliance record review document. The item numbers correspond with the related sections of the compliance record review document. There will be more details throughout the training. Uh, the compliance record review document is based on the requirements for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and 2008 KARs or Kentucky Administrative Regulations for special education programs. The compliance record review document serves as a guide to promote a consistent standard for districts to use for compliance and reviews of student due process folders to facilitate development and of a valid and reliable tool for compliance and consolidated monitoring and to, uh, to assist in accurate data collection of information required for KDE's purpose and federal state performance plan and annual uh, performance report. Uh, so what is the SPP or the APR? The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act requires each state to submit a state performance plan and to annually report data on the state's status toward meeting the targets of the indicators contained in this plan. This report of the status is called the Annual Performance Report and is submitted on or before the first day of February each year. To determine Kentucky's status toward achieving these targets of the SPP, OSEAL collects data from local school districts, parents, and other sources. These data are reviewed, interpreted, and reported in the APR. The APR contains information about how the state performed for each of these indicators. It, inc it includes explanations for meetings 
uh, for meeting or not meeting targets as well as continued activities for maintaining or improving performance. States are also required to publicly uh, publish the performance of each district on the targets for these indicators. On this slide, you're going to see that we have the indicators 49A through I, including 50. And I'm not going to read 49A through I for you. Uh, it's there. You can read it. And uh, we're going to continue the rest of the, uh, the slideshow about all of these indicators. The snapshot of 49A in the Compliance Record Review document. Um, what I look for is, is we're looking in the IEP for appropriate measurable secondary goals. The directions are that we mark a yes if the IEP includes post-secondary goals to cover two areas, which is education, training, and employment. And a third goal is present um, for independent living. Now, your independent living will be for your low incident students. Uh, we mark 49A yes only if one and two and three, if appropriate, are included in the goals. If there are only one post-secondary goal in the IEP, then both the training or education and employment boxes must be checked in the goal. If there is more than one goal in the IEP, then the training and education and employment boxes must both be checked at least once below any of these goals. Now, we have some other required uh, components that we must consider. The post-secondary goals must be measurable in, and in the intended outcomes to occur after the student graduates from high school. Post-secondary goals must align with other available student information or data that's present. It could be the student interest or the student's preferences. Post-secondary goal employment must be specific to the individualized student, the job, the specific job. If a student information or data indicate a need for an independent living post-secondary goal, the ARC includes an independent living goal in the IEP. When we're looking at the reference to the KARs concerning the transition services, it tells us that in the child's eighth grade year, or when the child has turned the age of 14, that an alignment with the child, we have to have an alignment with the child's ILP. Uh, sometimes we look at this and we look at their IEP, and if a child starts, uh, has an, uh, it turns 14 within that IEP, we start that at that time. So uh, by the child's 16th birthday, we then have appropriate measurable post-secondary goals and those are age appropriate and they're based on the transition assessments that you provide to the student. Uh, we have it that has to be related to the training, the education and employment, and when appropriate, your independent living skills. So on this slide, we have some examples of compliant uh, post-secondary goals uh, for students uh, that are attending college uh, or may be attending technical school or they may be going to the military. And so you can see, um, and then also on the job training for uh, some of your lower incidence uh, students. So uh, in any instance, you always are gonna do the same types of things. You're going to insert where they're going to get the training and education, and then you're gonna insert the job that you're specifically going to do. So in this slide, you have the post-secondary goal requirements after high school, and you insert the student's name, and then the actual place where they receive the education or training, and then you actually put in the specific job. Here 
here are some examples of how compliant post-secondary uh, independent living goals should be written. They should include, when writing a post-secondary independent living goal, you must still include separate goal for training and education and employment in the student's IEP, even if your living skill goal includes training or education and employment. Post-secondary independent living goals uh, should be measurable to describe what skill the student is actually going to do independently and how or where they are going to use that skill. What makes a goal measurable is what independent skill does a student plan to do? And what is the student plan for how or where they are going to use the skill? Let's look at goal one. Use of an augmentative communication device to communicate his wants and needs. If you'll notice, that is highlighted in purple. It explains what independent skill they are going to do. In the home and in the community, that is also highlighted in purple, explains how and where they are going to use the skill. Okay, so now let's look at goal two. Independently live is highlighted in purple. It explains what independent skill they are going to do. Complete her self-care need is also highlighted in purple, and it explains the how and where they are going to use that skill at the Carl Perkins Center. So here are some examples of how post-secondary goals should not be written. What makes these post-secondary goals non-compliant? Number one, does not include specific training or education. And number two, does not include specific employment. Let's look at goal number one. Job training program, highlighted in purple, explains the specific training or education of how the student will get the required training or education. This is correct, however, Retail site setting highlighted, highlighted in purple does not specifically state what employment the student plans to pursue, so this is non-compliant as a goal. Explain uh, an example of how to explain to make this compliant would be after high school, Jody's goal is to improve job skills through on-the-job training at a retail store to be able to work as a cashier. Let's look at goal number two. Learn from a job coach highlighted in purple does not specifically explain how the student plans to get the required training or education. So this goal is already non-compliant. And local business highlighted in purple as well does not specifically state what employment the student intends to em be employed as. So this goal is also non-compliant in that way. An example of how to make this compliant would be after high school, Jeremy will learn with a job coach to be able to be employed part-time in a local business with supports as a receptionist. This is a snapshot from Infinite, Infinite Campus. Uh, it gives us three options for the beginning of the goal uh, writing. Uh, the three, after high school, after graduation, or upon completion of high school. You can use that drop-down box and choose which one that you would prefer. Uh, the post-secondary goal, when we're looking at that, um, we have to select education, training, or employment, or independent living. Under post-secondary goal, we have to select the drop-down box and choose the statement you want to do regarding uh, what the student will be doing after high school. And then the student's goal is to enter the specific education of how and where the student plans to get their required training or education. And then below to be able to, you enter the specific employment behavior of what the student plans to be employed. So here we have uh, another screenshot from Infinite Campus. Uh, for the post-secondary goal, you select education training or employment or independent living. Uh, under post-secondary goal, select the drop-down box to choose the statement you want to use regarding what the student will be doing after high school. And uh, below, the student's goal is to type the specific independent skill they are going to do, uh, and then uh, below to be able to type how and where they are going to use the specific independent skill. Okay, now we're looking at 49B, uh, Transition Services. 
to, to see available transition service options, you have to click on the folder next to the transition service. Uh, in the box, type in the appropriate transition service. And the next step is you have to add the agency that is responsible for that service. So in the box, type the appropriate agency responsible for providing the transition service or services. So after you've completed the required components in Infinite Campus, the student's post-secondary goals should look like this example uh, in this slide when printed out on the student's IEP. This is a snapshot of item 49B. Uh, what we're looking for here is we're looking in the IEP under the transition services and agencies responsible for the post-secondary goal. So for the directions, we marked yes if transition services is included uh, services that the district or the school provides for the child and, if appropriate, other agencies responsible. So we want to note that the types of post-secondary transition services may include instruction, related services, community experiences, development of employment, and other post-school adult living objectives, and, if appropriate, acquisition of daily living skills and provide of a functional vocational evaluation. One transition services that must be listed in every child is providing the course of study as outlined in their ILP. Transition services must assist the student in reaching the student's education, training, and employment, and if appropriate, independent living post-secondary transition goals specified in the student's IEP. The requirement for 49B is stated in the box the IEP includes post-secondary transition services that are needed to assist the child in reaching post-secondary goals. So transition services are defined as a coordinated set of activities that are updated annually. The transition planning process is student-centered, student-driven, and embedded throughout the IEP process. In Kentucky, the process of planning post-secondary transition services begins when the student is in the 8th grade or age 14, whichever occurs first, the student is invited to each ARC meeting where transition services are to be discussed. Coordinated transition activities are results-oriented and focus on improving the student's academic and functional achievement. They facilitate the student's movement from school to post-secondary school activities, are based on the results of age-appropriate transition assessments, and consider the student's needs, strengths, preferences, and interests. They are not the only choices. Uh, and there are some that we can think of otherwise. One thing that I would point out would be the uh, importance of updating your transitions assessments as often as needed uh, because you do not want to continue to refer to those assessments and that information, that data, uh, as it uh, gets over a year old. So on this slide, you have a continuation of some more choices for post-secondary transition services. These are just examples, and uh, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list, but is a list that you can choose from as an example uh, for those services. After you have completed the required components in Infinite Campus, your completed post-secondary transition services and agency section of the IP should look like this slide. Transition services are meant to assist the student in reaching their post-secondary goal. For some students, this may mean transition services that are needed early in their educational career. Transition services should not be the same for every student. Transition services are not dependent on the student, student's current grade level. So this is a snapshot of item 49C in the compliance record review document in the transition services section. Um, when you look at the uh, record review document, you'll want to look for in your record review file the notice of admission and release committee meeting. Um, the directions for this are to mark yes if the notice of mission release committee meeting indicated that an outside agency is responsible for providing or paying for transition services that are needed to assist the child in reaching post-secondary goals and they were, they were invited to the meeting. 
and then you would mark yes if the ARC document that need for an outside agency was not appropriate, the child's IEP did not include transition services that required another agency, or the parent refused consent to invite an outside agency. So this is a, a section that may not be left blank if the student is age 16 or older. This is a snapshot of the uh, notice of meeting, the ARC notice of meeting document needed to mark yes for item 49C in the compliance record review document in the trans transition services section. If an outside agency is to be invited uh, to the ARC meeting for post-secondary transition purposes, the ARC doc documents this on the meeting notice. If no outside agency is listed, then you would mark not appropriate at this time. And outside agencies may include, but are not limited to, Office of Voc Rehab, Commission for Children with Special Health Care Needs, and the Department of Mental Health. There may be transition services listed that involve an, another agency, but will not be implemented until the child's senior year. This may be noted as an agency involved, but marked on the invitation that an invitation for this agency to send a representative to the ARC is not appropriate at this time. And the conference summary should capture that um, when you uh, document your uh, decisions in that process. It is also strongly recommended that the ARC discuss the need for outside agencies and record that discussion in the conference summary action notice. It must be clear what actions the ARC is not or is going to take regarding the need for outside agencies related to the provision of post-secondary transition services. This is a snapshot of item 49D in the CLIMS, uh, Compliance Record Review document. Um, what we're looking for here is consent for outside agency invitation. So for our directions, we, have to, we can mark yes if the documentation includes a signed, dated by the parents or the emancipated student, uh, the consent for outside agency invitation obtained prior to the notice of admissions and release committee. If a representative of an outside agency that is likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services is invited to the ARC meeting. We also mark yes if item 49C indicates that the ARC documented need for other agency that was not appropriate for the student's IEP did not include transition services that required another agency. A consent for outside agency invitation form is not needed. The following slide includes uh, some documentation about an OSEP letter that uh, was sent to states uh, on March 17, 2008 regarding wh when districts were required to get consent to evaluate from parents when inviting an outside agency. And the result of that was that districts are uh, supposed to get that consent each time they invite an outside agency. So it's not appropriate uh, or not permissible under this regulation for parents. Uh, of a public agency to, to obtain consent uh, of the parents or eligible child only one time before the transition planning process is initiated for the child until they leave school. When a child with a disability reaches the age of majority, all rights under the KAR Chapter 1 shall transfer from the parents to the child unless the child has been declared incompetent under a KRS Chapter 387 in a court of law. An LEA shall notify the child with a disability and the parents of the transfer of the rights. This is a snapshot of an example of a consent for outside agency form needed for item 49D in the compliance transition section. IDEA requires that consent be informed, which means that the parent or emancipated student must be informed as to which agencies are invited to participate in post-secondary transition planning and implementation. The consent document must be clear 
without with, about what period of time the consent is provided so that the parent or the emancipated student understands the permission he or she is providing. Since the conversations at each IEP team meeting are not the same, and since confidential information about the child is always discussed, we believe that consent must be obtained prior to each IEP meeting if a public agency proposes to invite a representative of any participating agency that is likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. Therefore, it is not permissible under this regulation for a public agency to obtain the consent of the parents or eligible child only one time before the transition planning process is initiated for the child until the child leaves school. Prior consent must be obtained prior to any IEP discussing transition. So 49E is looking at multi-year course of study and we're looking to see that the multi-year course of study is based on the individual learning plan and that the multi-year course of study is in fact embedded in the IP or in the individual learning plan. Uh, we would mark yes if that is the case and, um, and there's notes of the discussion of the review of the student's multi-year course of study that is documented in the ARC conference summary and then also a copy of the student's ILP that includes the multi-year course of study or a copy of the child's multi-year course of study is embedded in the IEP. Course of study means a multi-year description of coursework from the student's current school year to the anticipated exit year designed to achieve the student's desired post-school outcomes or goals. Uh, courses should be identified by title. Uh, if the student is FMD, then the course code should also be included. Uh, the student's course of study is a multi-year description of coursework designed to help achieve the student's post-secondary goals. Documentation, documentation to support evidence of item 49E should be in the student's due process folder as required under the Kentucky requirements for transition and included at the age of 14 or in uh, when the child is in the 8th grade. A copy of the multi-year course of study should be filed in the due process file for special education. Multi-year means must include courses from the student's current year to the anticipated exit year.
if a student has not developed an ILP, uh, for example, a student coming from another state, uh, the ARC can begin that process with the development of a multi-year course of study. Check yes in the box and be able to show evidence of development of the multi-year course of study. This documentation shows that the ARC considered the student's ILP course of study and used it to develop the present level's transition needs statement. The ARC includes a copy of the student's multi-year course of study in the student's due process file. This can be documented in at least three different ways. One is the ARC uh, to print out a copy of the student's course of study from the ILP. The ILP calls the course of study an educational plan. Be sure that the student has entered courses for all years up to the exit year. Another way to document the student's course of study for the ARC to use a district form to outline the student's course of study. Some districts do both, allowing the ARC to talk with the student regarding courses completed and courses needed with the district form uh, that the student may later use to update the online ILP. Either way, the important thing is for the course of study to be there and for it to cover courses for every year uh, to the student's exit year. Documentation shows that the course of study was used to develop the IEP. Remember, the course of study should be prepared and designed to help the student achieve their post-secondary goals. It is also strongly recommended that the ARC document their discussion of the multi-year course of study within the ARC conference summary. This is a snapshot of where to include the multi-year course of study in the student's IEP and in Infinite Campus. Note, include all grade levels when completing the course of study. Course of study means a multi-year description of coursework from the student's current grade year to the anticipated exit year designed to achieve the student's desired post-school goals. Additional grades can be added. After you, after you have completed this required component in Infinite Campus, the student's completed multi-year course of study section of the IEP should look like this example when printed out of the IEP. Note, the multi-year course of study can be either the ILP or the IEP. The course of study must be specific courses of study, which means a multi-year course of study that uh, we do not use the word elective as a course. The actual elective course title must be provided. This ensures that the student's multi-year course of study is individualized. This is a snapshot of how the multi-year course of study appears in the ILP. So this is uh, for 49F and we'll be looking for the IEP annual goals or transition page and the conference summary form when doing the record review document. Um, we'll mark yes if for at least one annual goal the ARC documents which post-secondary goal the annual goal supports or the annual goals that supported post-secondary goals are listed as transition services on the transition page of the IEP. The requirement for 49F is stated in the box. Annual goals included in the IEP are related to the transition service needs. Um, education and training and employment must be checked. Independent living is checked when appropriate. If the IEP includes only one annual goal, then the goal must address both education and employment. If the IEP includes more than one annual goal, the ARC may, ch may check education training in one or more of the goals and employment in one or more of the goals. If the area of independent living is appropriate, an annual goal must be included to address this area. This is a snapshot of where to document the annual goals related to the transition services need in Infinite Campus. On the IEP form, there is a specific place to document that an annual goal supports the student's post-secondary goals. On the annual goal page, just under the annual goal and specially designed instruction. Let's look at the above example. 
This example shows how the ARC documented that the student's annual goal supports the employment and education and training goal. One thing to remember is that the ARC wouldn't check the box that an annual goal supports an independent living post-secondary goal if the student doesn't even have an independent living post-secondary goal. On the IEP form, there is a particular place to document that an annual goal supports the student's post-secondary goal or goals. On the annual goal page, just under the annual goal and special design instruction, let's look at the above example. This example shows how the ARC document and the student's annual goals support the student's education training goal and the employment goal separately. In the example above, only education training is documented as supporting goal number one because education training and employment needs to be documented as supporting the post-secondary transition goal. Employment needs to be included in goal number one or a second goal will be required to address employment. Remember, the ARC wouldn't check that an annual goal supports an independent living post-secondary goal if the student doesn't even have an independent living post-secondary goal. So for uh, 49G, uh, there's an inclusion of measurable post-secondary goals that are based on age-appropriate transition assessments. Assessments may include behavioral assessment information, aptitude test, interest and work inventories, intelligence test and achievement test, personality and preference test, career maturity or readiness test, self-determination assessments, work-related temperament scales, and transition planning inventories. The record includes documentation that the age-appropriate transition assessment data were used to provide information on the student's needs, strengths, preferences, and interests regarding each post-secondary goal. Age-appropriate means that the measure reflects the student's chronological age rather than the developmental age. So it's recommended that all students with independent living post-secondary goals on their IEPs have the following data sources on file. State-mandated test scores from high school, either alternate or standardized, psychological evaluation data, including description of area strengths and weaknesses, adaptive behavior scales, quarterly grades, semester grades, or progress notes. These are just some examples, not an exhaustive list. State assessments should not only uh, not be the only assessment listed. This is a snapshot of where to document the student's transition service assessments in Infinite Campus. On the IEP Forms transition page, there is a specific place to document the transition assessments used as a basis for determining the student's post-secondary goals. This section is entitled, What Transition Assessments That Were Used to Determine the Child's Preferences and Interest. The IRC also uses the information gathered from the administered transition assessments to develop the present level transition needs statement, as well as determine the student's post-secondary goals. When the ARC documents particular transition assessments in the present level transition needs statement, this indicates the ARC's use and consideration of the transition assessment data. As with any ARC discussion, it is rec also recommended that the ARC document its discussion in the ARC conference summary. Okay, so we're looking now at student involvement in the record review document, 49H. Uh, we're looking at the notice for the admissions and release committee. 
uh, we mark yes if the student is listed as invited to attend the meeting of the Notice of Admissions and Release Committee meeting. Uh, the requirement for 49H is stated in the box. The student is invited to the ARC meeting where transition services were discussed. So the student should be checked as invited on the notice of ARC meeting sent to the parents. Um, this screenshot will show that. The record should also show that the student's signature on uh, or documents attendance on the conference summary as attending the ARC meeting if in attendance. If the student does not attend, the ARC must document other steps that were taken to ensure that they were included, uh, inc including the student's interest and preferences and all that stuff was considered. This may include documentation of surveys, interviews, ILP, description in the ARC conference summary notes, etc. Sample documentation of students' involvement when unable to attend the ARC meeting, the KDA will look for the Notice of Admission Release Committee meeting notice to determine whether the checkbox indicates the student was invited to the meeting. The student's involvement, if he or she does not attend, can be documented in the conference summary. On 49I, we will be looking in the IEP and the conference summary again to find the documentation. We will mark yes if the IEP has been reviewed annually. Uh, we will look at the dates of the IEP and include updated post-secondary goals. Uh, mark yes if the IEP is the student's first IEP after turning 16. The requirement for in item 49A is stated in the box. The measurable post-secondary goals are updated annually. The ARC, ARC should document annual review of the IEP, including the post-secondary goals, by stating the meeting date and the anticipated review date of the IEP. By checking the late, last IEP date against the current IEP date, the annual timeline may be confirmed. Just as the student's ILP is updated annually to reflect changes in the education, training, and employment goals, so must the student's post-secondary goal in the IEP be updated. The ARC must review the student's transition assessment data to determine if more information is needed as a basis for developing new or revising post-secondary goals. If the student's post-secondary goal still reflects the student's goal and will remain the same, the ARC must document that in the conference summary and state that the post-secondary goal was discussed and will not be updated because it's appropriate and still remains that way. This slide shows that the post-secondary goal has been updated annually by previously uh, looking at the IEP that was previous and the current IEP um, and, and to see if there was some change in the goal. And then also to the ARC documents discussion and conference summary that the post-secondary goal is still the student's individualized goal with no change to the goals necessary. This slide is looking at all the requirements for indicator 13. Uh, this is number 50. So what we're looking at, we're looking at your summary of the record review, a 49A through I, and for our directions, we mark yes if all the requirements listed uh, in 49A through I are marked yes. And we have to mark no if one or more of the requirements listed uh, is marked no. And then we mark NA if the child is not yet 16 uh, as the date of the record review. The requirement for item 50 is stated in the box. For students who have reached the age of 16 and older, all the items at 49A through I requirements are met. We will now begin to discuss the compliance process for indicator 13. KDE must annual report data collected on 18 indicators to the Office of Special Education Programs. Here's where the compliance process is continued. Uh, KDE requires annual review of students' educational records. Districts are required to self-report data to the state. 
The state reports the data of the, to the Office of Special Education Programs. So here's some directions for record reviews. Student records must be selected randomly. In order to yield accurate information, student records must be selected on a random basis, and this means that records are not pre-selected. For example, selecting the record of every third, fifth, or tenth student from the child count roster is one means of random selection, or the district can use the online random choice selection programs that are available. Random also means that the records are selected by a variety of schools, teachers, case managers, and categories of disability. Random review is one way for the district to ensure accuracy. If the district is chosen for a consolidated monitoring visit, there is far greater likelihood that the KDE's record review will match the results of the district's review if the district has randomly selected its records. If the district has handpicked the records it reviewed and the Division of Learning Services uh, or OCL discovers inaccuracies during a data verification visit, the district will be cited for a violation of the timely and accurate data requirement. For the review to be valid, at least 10% of the district's child count must be selected for the review. No more than 50 student records are required to be reviewed by any district. If the district has 10 or fewer re records under the specific record review item, then all student records for that item must be reviewed. Please note that for Indicator 13, at least 10% of all records for students age 16 and above must be selected for review. This slide is corrections of non-compliance, violations of IDEA that can be remedied. Uh, during the record review process, districts may find items in student records that are violations of IDEA. Some of these violations may be remedied depending upon the nature of the violation. If remedied prior to submission of data to KDE, the violation is considered corrected. It is not reported to the district's data report as non-compliant. In most cases, it will be necessary for the district to convene an ARC to remedy the violations. The documentation of the ARC must reflect authentic and appropriate process and remedies. Continuing on with the non-compliance, only Indicator 13 items can be corrected prior to submission of the data to the KDE. If the record is corrected prior to submission to KDE, the record is considered to be in compliance. Examples of the violations that may be corrected are failure to document uh, post-secondary goals in the IEP, failure to document transition services in the IEP, failure to invite outside agencies, failure to document the student's multi-year course of study, failure to link annual goals to related post-secondary goals, failure to document evidence of transition assessment. Continuing on with the non-compliance, uh, examples of violations that may be corrected prior to KDE uh, include failure to document the post-secondary goals, uh, failure to document transition services in the IEP, failure to invite outside agencies, failure to document the student's multi-year course of study, failure to link annual goals and the an uh, related post-secondary goals, and failure to document evidence and transition assessment. 
Some violations of IDEA identified during the district's record review cannot be remedied in individual student records due to the nature of the violation. This must be reported as non-compliant in the district's data report. So for e examples of violations that cannot be re remedied include inviting outside agencies to ARC meetings prior to obtaining parent consent, that's 49D, or not inviting the ARC meeting or not inviting the student to the ARC meeting where transition services are discussed, 49H. Missing the timeline for updating post-secondary goals annually or not having transition requires it's in the IEP by the student's 16th birthday, that's number 50. Note, while these violations cannot be remedied, the district must correct the noncompliance in the individual student record unless the student's no longer with the district. For example, uh, failure to meet the timeline for an IEP with transition requirements met by 16th birthday cannot be remedied. However, it can be corrected for that student by ensuring that an appropriate that an appropriate that an appropriate IEP is in place, though out of timeline. Examples of violations that cannot be remedied include inviting outside agencies to ARC meetings prior to obtaining consent. That would be for 49D. Not inviting students to the ARC meeting where the transition services are discussed. 49H. Missing the timeline for updating post-secondary goals, 49I, and not having all the requirements in the IEP by the student's 16th birthday, number 50. While these violations cannot be remedied, the district must correct the noncompliance with the individual student record unless the student has left the district and is no longer under the jurisdiction of the district. For example, failure to meet the timeline for an IEP with transition requirements met by the 16th birthday cannot be remedied. However, it can be corrected for that student by ensuring an appropriate IEP is in place though out of timeline. Systemic corrections is required anytime a district is found to have more than two errors that reflect the same error that is considered systemic and must be addressed and corrected. If you have questions regarding any of these Indicator 13 training documents, please contact the Division of IDEA Monitoring and Results, OSEAL, at the Kentucky Department of Education at 502-564-4970 or if you have questions uh, locally, you can contact uh, Brenda Combs and Denny Paul May at KVEG uh, through the uh, usual means. Thank you very much and have a great day.